everybody needs one of them. Continuing on with nine. If anybody needs a nine, we're continuing on. Billy Slane's home with a strep throat, too, so I didn't remember her. Billy Slane's home with strep. All right, we talked about some of this and kind of review some of this this, morning, this evening. Um, kind of an interesting little study on baptism and started out with kind of where that word uh, comes from particularly, which is kind of an interesting story in itself. Um, okay. No worky. There it goes. Well, do you do that or did I do it? There. Did I do that? Did I do that? No. <laughs> huh? No, I got power. See? <laughs> Is it plugged in up there? Anyhow, kind of talked a little bit about language, uh, the idea of a transliterated word as compared to a translated word. And the word baptism is a, transla a transliterated word. Uh, translation is, a comp com is the comprehension of the meaning of a text and the subsequent production of an equivalent text, likewise called a translation, that communicates the same message in another language. So we should understand, right, translating if I translate something into another language, I get the meaning of the text, the meaning of what I'm trying to say. It's not just about moving the words, because sometimes word per word doesn't really tell us anything, right? Um, just to move the words can be kind of confusing. Translation's more than that. And I think that's what makes it so difficult. Translation is trying to get the meaning of the, the meaning of what you're saying, not just what you're saying, but what does it mean? How does it come off in your language? Um, a lot of times if people that don't know English very well talk to me and they'll be like, you know, how do you say, you know, how do you say it? I don't know how to say it. You know, I know the words, but I don't know how to say it. But that's translation, which we talk about a lot. But then on the other hand, okay, flip me since I'm not flipping. On the other hand, uh, uh, transliteration is the practice of converting a text from one system into another in a systematic way. And I talked about that last week how a lot of words in our language are transliterated words. They're not translated words, they're transliterated words. And those come out of Latin, they come out of Greek. Those are a lot of the root languages that we see our language evolve out of. Um, I use the word sincere. Sincere as an example. Comes out of the Latin, sincere, means without wax. But that's just a transliterated. So when they s use that word and they... If we translated that, we would say without wax. That really wouldn't mean much to us uh, to say that. But if we use the word sincere, we understand what that means. Honest, sound, um, we understand the meaning of the word. Transliterating word allows us to put a different definition on a new word. So in the Bible, that happens a lot. The word church is a really, really good example of that. The word church in the Bible in the Greek is ecclesia. If that was translated, literally translated, it would be assembly, okay? But what happened was in translation, they made a new word entirely, church, and then they were able to put the meaning on that word. What does that mean? Well, when King James did it, it meant Church of England, right? Because he wanted the authority to be in the church, Church of England, not in the assembly, but in the church. If he would have said assembly, then that would have been everybody, right? not just the Church of England, and he wanted the authority to be in the church. But then over time, we've defined that word, haven't we? It's become part of our language, and we've, and we've put a definition on it. So when we say church, well, that, depending on who you are, I guess, could mean different things, but generally we would think of a religious organization, maybe a building or maybe an organization. That's the meaning we would put with that word because we've, we've defined that word in our language, 
So, so when we do that, that's something that we're able to do. The reason the word baptism became a transliterated word, go ahead and flip me, the become a transliterated word is because uh, translation performs a mapping from one alphabet to another. Go to the next slide. We actually, we've already done this once. I'm just reviewing. So the word baptism comes from the word baptizo, in baptizo, in, or baptizo sometimes in the Greek. So that's the Greek word. So instead of them translating that word, because if you was to translate the word, it would be immersion, plain and simple. It's a simple word to translate. We know what it means. It means to immerse. Simple translation. All you got to do is say, wherever it says baptism or baptizo in the Greek, you just say immerse. Simple. Same way with the ecclesia. If they would have just translated it, every place in the Bible you see the word church, it would have just said assembly. Plain and simple. Real easy. Simple, easy peasy, right? But you have to understand translators. <laughs> when you translate a text, especially a biblical text, a theological text, it becomes, really it becomes biased because there's not a person or an organization or a group of people that have ever translated the Bible from Greek and Hebrew to English or to another language, any language, that didn't have some sort of a theological drift to what they were trying to translate, right? They kind of have their own theology. And the best way to promote your theology is to translate text in a way that works with your theology, makes, makes it look better. That's just how they do it. Well, since you and, you and I, at least I'm not, and I doubt anybody in here is fluent in Greek, and none of us are fluent in Hebrew, then we're kind of at the mercy of translators to put it into our language. And we have to try to make meaning out of that text. So... King James Version was translated in like 1640, early 1600s. And at the time that that was translated, a lot had gone on, right? Uh, the English had kicked the Catholic Church out of England and because of Henry VIII. You all know Henry VIII, right? Henry VIII wanted an annulment, and the Roman Catholic Church wouldn't give him an annulment. And for other reasons. Henry VIII kicked the Roman Catholic Church out of England. One thing, he wanted their land, he wanted their property, he wanted their assets, and the easiest way for him to do that was to kick them to the curb. So when he kicked them out of England, he started his own church, the Church of England. Okay, And so at the time King James comes along, by that time the Church of England's established, there's a lot going on religiously in history at that particular point in history. The Bible is getting translated into English. The Church of England is a lot more willing to see that happen. The Roman Catholic Church, on the other hand, absolutely does not see, want to see it go into English. So a lot of things are going on. But King James puts together these guys, 16 different scholars in two different universities, and he says he wants to translate very first time the Bible's really translated from the original language into English. So almost every other translation was original language to Latin, Latin to English. So, but Latin's a bad intermediate language because Latin doesn't have as many words as Greek or English. So it makes it kind of hard to get meaning in Latin because you just don't have enough words in Latin to really make it work like you want it to. So he, by that time, we're in Trench, Church of England is there, King James is translating the Bible, and he does not want the word assembly used for one thing. That was a big controversy in, the, in that translation. He said, you're, you're going to use the word church. You really put his foot down on that. We're going to use the word church. And the other problem we have is this word baptism, baptizo, in the Greek, because at the time that he translated this, uh, Church of England was like the Roman Catholics. They were pedio Baptists. Uh, they baptized infants. And if you've ever seen an infant baptized, you generally don't hold them under the water, right? You generally just pour water on their forehead or sprinkle water on them or wipe water across them. They do it different ways. Generally, they just put them over a basin and pour water over their head, right? So if he would have translated this word baptize, immerse, that would have been a real issue. 
because they didn't immerse for nobody got immersed and there was no adult baptisms so there was no adults getting immersed uh, into the into the church and and if we went into our church history I could tell you the anti-baptists who started immersing adults were persecuted and some of them were killed because they did that it was that was a big deal we take it for granted it was a big deal when it started happening okay because it went against the theology of the day it was radical it was heretical right it was terrible because we don't do that we don't baptize adults we baptize babies we pour water over babies heads we don't immerse so we can't really translate this word immersion because since we're translating in English and people can read it and this is when the great Bible came out not because it was a great Bible all Bibles are great Bibles but because it was really big Okay, and so King James, when he translated the Bible, they did these great Bibles. They called them the great Bibles because they were really, really big, and he put one at the pulpit of every church in England. So every church had this great Bible, they called it. It was a big Bible on their pulpit. So people who could read, which were in a lot of people in those days, because a lot of people were illiterate, but people who could read were able to read this for themselves. And you can't put immersion in there because if you do that, guess what? We got a problem. We don't immerse. It's a problem. So what do we do? We transliterate the word. We take the word baptizo. We, tr we map it into another language, baptism. And we put our own definition of the word, what it means. Problem solved, right? Problem solved. So now we're hung with another word that somehow just pops up, and we really don't know what it means. Okay, flip me. And... Hello, Shannon. There we go. So we see in the Bible that places that they baptized had a lot of water, which goes along with the idea of immersion. In John 3, 23, there was plenty of water. Matthew 3, 16, he went up out of the water when Jesus was baptized. Go ahead and flip me, Shannon. And he, in Acts 8, 38, the chariot and the eunuch, he went down into the water and Philip baptized him, baptizo in the Greek. Once again, transliterated word should have just been immersed. Should just say, and Philip immersed him. That's what it should say. That's what he did. He immersed him. So people say, well, Rex, I get that question a lot. So if I was sprinkled or I was wiped or I was poured on, was I baptized? And I said, well, by the definition of the word, you weren't. Because the definition of the word is immerse. So, you know, by the definition of the word, no, you were not. You were not immersed. So, I always think that's the best way to answer. That's just a fact. The word means to immerse. So, if you're not immersed, if you're poured on, sprinkled on, wiped, are you, are you baptized? Well, by the definition of the word, you're not. You know, you're not. So, anyway, something to think about. A lot of argument about that, obviously. Okay, flip me again. And in Acts twenty two sixteen, Paul reiterating his conversion on the road to Damascus, Damascus, he says, he says, Ananias said to him, Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So in Paul's recant of his conversion, he put that right there, you know, to be baptized to wash away your sins. Okay, flip me, Shan. So in Galatians 3, 26 and 27, which is, if you know me, you know it's one of my favorite baptism verses. It says, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith, which that's good. The world believes that. But then in 27, the word for there is G-A-R in the Greek. means let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. All of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Put the word immersed in there because that's what that word means. Because so all those who were immersed into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. And he says there's no longer Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor free, we're all one in Christ Jesus and heirs according to the promise of Abraham. The rest of that verse. So, so that's where that, how that fits. Okay, flip me, Shan. Are there any questions? I'm kind of rehashing. Go ahead. Well, yeah, nobody knew. I mean, okay, so, 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 
it was that way for centuries. The Catholic Church controlled it for centuries, and, you know, they were pedio baptists They baptized infants. So, I mean, that's what they did for centuries. And the, and the Catholic Church kept God's Word locked up. The Latin Vulgate, it was in Latin, but not many people can read Latin. Fewer people can read Greek. And the Catholic Church used the Latin Vulgate. So, uh, you got to remember, when the Bible was translated into English, people died for that. That the Catholic Church did not want the Bible in English. People got killed for translating the Bible into English. That was that was big. They got burned, and yeah, it was it was big. Catholic Church did not want the Bible translated into English. Well, nobody knew. Most people were illiterate. The church kept the scripture locked away, and people didn't know. You just didn't. Nobody knew. How could you know? Nobody had Bibles like we have. Nobody. You know, all you could do was go listen to what somebody told you it meant. You didn't have a way to look at it for yourself. Boy, we was in that passages exhibit, which I guess now is probably part of the Bible Museum in Washington, D.C., but uh, they were, like, going through that translation, and they had, like, a little deal, like a little wax thing of people talking, but they were, like, talking about, man, we're going to go there, and they're going to really they're gonna read the Bible. Somebody's going to read the Bible, and it's like everybody's really excited because you, nobody, you never could do that, you know, no, nobody knew. I mean, getting the Bible to English was a is, a is a good story. It was a process. It was a process. And then it wasn't very widely, it wasn't very uh, circulated because it was hard, you know. But then when the printing press came out, um, you know, that changed the world. The printing press changed the world. When they were able to mass produce uh, Bibles and, and put them in people's hands, that was, that was a huge that was a huge thing. Bible went into English. Bible, you know, Wycl Wycliffe translated the Bible into German. Um, so once that got out, people could read it for themselves. It changed. But you got to remember, all those guys were pedio Baptists. Every one of those guys was a pedio Baptist. They, they weren't immersing adults. I mean, you almost got to go to Zwigli and, and the anti-Baptist movement was when they really started, which is actually where your Amish... Amish, I should say, your Amish and your Quakers and those, that branch actually came out of the anti, what they called the anti-Baptist movement, which was, those were the ones, the reason they called them anti-Baptists is because they said infant baptism isn't any good. They were anti-infant, an anti pedio baptists So they were re-baptizing people as adults. And the guy that was doing that, they told him, they said, if you don't quit doing that, we're going to kill you. And they did. They did. They killed him because he was baptizing adults. They was rebaptizing people as adults, and they did kill him. And then, even as even as religion came into America, it was predominantly Presbyterian. It was predominantly Calvinistic. John Calvin, Locke, um, Richard Locke, John Calvin. Those were the big influencers. It was mostly Presbyterian. It was uh, Methodist. Those were the big denominations that came over from Scotland, England, um, Ireland. They were all pedio Baptists. All of them were. So there was no adult baptism. So you, you really got to get into the you really got to get into the late 1700s before you get guys like Alexander Campbell and Barton Stone and those guys who actually started to say, oh yeah, that's not right, and in the original language and started to baptize adults. You, it's pretty recent. It's pretty recent. I mean, we're not talking ancient history here. We're talking. We're talking 18, turn of the century, 1800, 1801 was, was uh, Cain Ridge Revival was 1801, and really that's kind of where all that started. Well, that's what we call the first great awakening of the of the religion of the United States, and that's really where that started. So late 1700s is when, really, but there was still tremendous, you know, uh, Alexander Campbell did all kinds of debates, you can Google it, all kinds of debates against infant baptism. That was his biggest topic of debate was Adult baptism versus infant baptism. And should we baptize babies or should we baptize adults? That was one of the biggest topics of debate in the early 1800s in the church was, uh, was pedio baptism. So this is fairly recent. Fairly recent. Um, and we looked at this, Acts 2, 41. Click that again, Shan. And we looked at, uh, put them together, 41 and 47. Um, Adam were baptized and and added we're saved and we put that together that both of those things add you so they got to be equal to each other not that baptism or getting wet and i brought that up last week and alone is that's not what saves you but that is kind of the end process of the process 
it's kind of like when you finally sign your name on the dotted line, you know, is what that is. I mean, you've got to believe, you've got to confess. There's other things. I'm not a watery generationalist. I don't think we could just line everybody up and dunk them in the baptistry and say, oh, good, you're going to heaven. But, uh, you know, it's the end of a process, but it is the end of that process, and the Bible backs that up, and it's how you get into the Lord's body. And I think that's really, really important when we talk about baptism. It's what gets us in the body. Nothing else can do that, not a creed or a confession. And that's one thing the early restorationalists really wrestled with because at the time that they really started putting this together and understanding what the Bible is really saying, at that time you didn't get into a, to a church. When I use that word the way you probably would think that word is a religious organization. You didn't get into that um, through baptism. You got into that by confession of a creed or by being voted in. Um, and that was based on your salvational experience. And that's the way I was raised. I was raised exactly like that. Um, it was by your salvational experience. Had nothing to do with baptism. Baptism was just, that's how you, I don't really know what it was. Um, it's how it got you into that particular place or something. But it had nothing to do with your salvation. My, I, I was raised that way my whole life. Baptism is just an outward sign of an inward cleansing and, you know, uh, it's not important for your salvation. You know, you need to say the prayer. You need to confess Jesus is Lord and you'll be saved. Um, all that's come out of Reformation. I mean, if you've ever studied, sat through my church history classes, all that came out of Reformation. Um, but that's not how it works. When people were baptized into the Lord, they were added to the assembly, not the church, right? And I think that's where language and translation becomes so important right words are important you know uh um you're baptized you're immersed into the assembly that's that's how it works I mean, that's the way we should say it that's exactly what it means that's exactly what happens you're immersed into the assembly of saved people that's that's how this works and that's how it's always worked so um they struggled with this you can see why because for centuries people didn't do this and Cal and, and Campbell and all those reformers, they really agonized over this, you know, because was there really a church for all those centuries? I don't know the answer to these questions. I don't know the heart of God. I don't know, right? But they agonized over this stuff, as you could probably imagine. It was agony for them to try to figure this out. And they thought, well, if we did it wrong for centuries, was there really even a church for all those centuries? I'm not going to get into that discussion. But but you can understand how this was really big. It's, it is big. Flip me. So, Shannon. <laughs> so anyway, now we get to some, host some new ground, don't we? Uh, Acts 19. This was, P, this was Paul um, going to Ephesus, and he went across some certain disciples and he asked them some really pertinent questions. Um, he said, Apollos was at Corinth. Paul took the road through the interior, traveled, arrived at Ephesus. And there he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, that's a pointed question that I probably don't have time to get into. But the Holy Spirit wasn't necessary for their salvation, and that's how come he said, did you receive it? Because in order to receive it, somebody would have had to have imparted it on them. They said, we don't know. We don't even heard there's a Holy Spirit. So Paul asks, then what baptism did you receive? And they said, John's baptism. Now, John baptized for repentance and also for forgiveness. That's another subject. But... but we know John early, he baptized for repentance. And so they said, and that's what Paul said. Paul said, John baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him. And on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. You know, if it wasn't important, then why rebaptize them, right? I mean, why bother? It doesn't make any sense. He didn't baptize them to give the Holy Spirit because if you read the passage a little further, it says, then he laid his hands on them and gave them the Holy Spirit. They didn't get the Holy Spirit when they were baptized. He gave them the Holy Spirit after that. But they were saved and added to the Lord's body when they were baptized for the right reason. And there's a couple of things that really stick out here we need to think about. 
One is, is that you have to know why you're baptized. You have to have a knowledge. Um, if you don't have knowledge of why you're baptized, then you're just getting wet. You can't be taught wrong and baptized right, I don't believe. You have to know why you're being baptized. Now, people ask me all the time. They're bat so, while well, I'm baptized in the church of Christ, I care less. I really don't even care, okay? What I want to know is, is why in your mind, why were you baptized? That's all you need to answer, that question. Why was I baptized? In your mind, if you said, I was baptized for the remission of my sins, I really don't care where or who did it. It makes no difference at all to me. Because that's why, if you know that, that's good. I, I, and, a lot, and, and I know people used to be, when I would say that, you guys are pretty good because people used to suck the air right out of the auditorium and the walls would just fall in, you know, because everybody would say, well, you said you have to be baptized in the Church of Christ. The Church of Christ is the body of Christ. That's, based, that's what that means. Church means assembly. Am I right? Isn't that what I said? So Church of Christ is assembly of Christ, right? Isn't that what it is? If you're baptized for the mission of your sins, you're added into the assembly. Am I right? You can't, you can't be saved and not be part of the assembly of Christ. Now, we use the word church in place of assembly, but you can't be saved and not be part of that. People say all, tell me all the time, said, well, I'm saved, but I'm not, I'm not a member of any church. It's not possible. It's impossible. It's not possible. You can't be saved and not be part of the assembly of the saved people of the earth. You can't, you can't do that. Um, so when we say here, if you look on the sign, it says Church of Christ meets here. This isn't the Church of Christ. We're the Church of Christ. We're the assembly. of. It sounds so much better when I say we're the assembly of Christ, right? We're the assembly of the saved because we've been obedient to Jesus and he's added us because of our obedience and baptism. So people all the time, they'll say, what do I have to do to join your church, Rex? I say, number one, it's not my church. It's, church, it's God, it's Jesus' church. He died for it. He bled for it. I didn't do anything for it. I said, it's only my church and the fact that I'm a member of it. That's, that's all. And I'm a member of it because, because Jesus added me. And if you want to be a member of this body, then you just need to be baptized for the mission of your sins, and you're a member of this body, and no, that's not up to anybody but you and God. So... You know, terminology is important, right? How we say it. So people say, "Why do you do I need to be rebaptized into this church?" I'm like, "If you was baptized for the right reasons, you're you're a member of this church. It's, you, you can't. You understand what I'm saying here? You can't split that. You know, <laughs> you can't separate that out. So you have to have knowledge. Why don't we baptize infants?" Huh? Can an infant know why they're being baptized? <laughs> Can an infant have knowledge? Nobody in the New Testament was ever baptized without hearing the Word of God, right? So we say children are safe, don't we? We don't say they're saved because that's a decision you have to make as an adult. But we say they're safe, and we, and we believe that, right? The children are safe. But once you come to a knowledge that you, what sin is and the relationship you need to have, then you're responsible for your salvation. And there's not an age on that, contrary to my childhood when everybody said it was 12. Uh, there's not an age on that, right? 12 was the age of accountability. Y'all heard that when I was growing up. That's what I heard all the time. 12 is the age of accountability. Boy, better get straight. The time you're 12. Turn 13, you're done. <laughs> right? <laughs> but that's not true. And you guys know that as well as I do. Some children mature really fast. I've baptized some children at 10 or 11 or nine years old that probably knew what was going on and I figured if they didn't we'd do it again later there's no damage in double dipping right but um but I, there's some people who will never need to be baptized because some people are never mentally they're mentally uh compromised or whatever they're never gonna they're never gonna have to be baptized because they're never really gonna have a knowledge of what this means because they just you see what I'm saying it's different for all of us you know we're responsible for our salvation um so, Jesus, so here Paul makes that distinction. Flip me, Shan. So here he makes that distinction. Um, repentance is necessary in Scripture. Matter of fact, the Bible says that, that God's long-suffering to, to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And repentance in the Bible is, is a turning towards God. 
sometimes I'll baptize people that are really, really good people. And I've had people even say, well, what do I need to repent of? I mean, I, I live a really good life. I don't cheat. I don't murder. I don't steal. I'm a good citizen. I'm a good person. What do I need to repent of? And I said, well, repentance is not just saying I need to not do that again. In the Bible, repentance is actually a turning towards God, a turning away from the world. That's what it is. You turn towards God. You turn away from the world. You repent uh, of that life, of that life, and you look towards God, and that's what, and that's what's necessary to do. In Acts two thirty eight, he says, "Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is to you and your children, and all those who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call." And that comes out of Joel. Um, that's probably the pat verse for baptism in the Church of Christ, Acts 2.38. That's the one everybody knows. Um, what about people who don't believe in baptism? How do they deal with Acts 2.38? Um, that's a really valuable question because I grew up in a, in a denomination that didn't believe baptism was necessary for the forgiveness of your sins. So the word for here becomes really, 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 really important. And there's actually three different Greek words for the word for. And most of the time, we only deal with two of those Greek words. One of them is a word I used in Galatians 3. The word G-A-R means gar, and that's let me tell you why. But this time, the word for is a different word. It's ace in the Greek, E-I-S in the Greek. And that word means in order to. If you look at a study Bible that's, that's from a denomination that doesn't believe that baptism is necessary, I believe study Bibles are often the work of the devil, but if you have a study Bible and you'll read where it says this on Acts 2.38, um, what it's going to tell you is it's going to say that that means because of. So in other words, instead of it, it would read as follows. It would say repent and be baptized um, because of the remission of your sins. So if I put it that way, then it means that my baptism doesn't have anything to do with my sins being forgiven. It just means that I'm doing it because my sins were forgiven. Um, and so that's a, that's a really big topic. And years ago, when we used to have debates with people from denominations, and some, we don't have those conversations much anymore, it seems, but uh, several years ago, I, I had people say, don't slip on the ice. And that's what they were talking about because it's, the, it's ice or ace in, in the Greek. But the word, that word uh, in the Greek, E-I-C, in the Greek, Every other place in the Bible, and we know the proper translation of that word is in order to. So that word for here, ace, ice in the Greek, E-I-C, um, it means in order to. So the way it should be translated would be, if you properly translated Acts 2.38, it would be turn, okay, and be immersed, Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, in order to the forgiveness of your sins. And that's where the verse should end. Just telling you. Verse should end there. It shouldn't end. The end, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, belongs with verse 39. The verse should end right there. Um, because two th if you put this 239, it makes sense. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises to you and your children and all those who are far off. Makes sense. But that's the way it should be translated, and that's the way it should be broken. So that's how people get around that. They say, well, it's because of. It's not in order to you have your sins forgiven. It's because your sins have already been forgiven. Because the word for can mean that in our language, can it? The word for can mean because of, right? Um, you know, take your, you know... Um, we can, we can, I'm trying to think of an English way to put that, but we use that word because of something, right? Um, it, can, it can mean that. The word for can have many different meanings depending on context. But in this case, the proper translation here is in order to. And it's not, like I said, if you look at 327 uh, Galatians, the word there is gar. It says, let me tell you why, but that makes no sense here. That's not the word we use in the Greek here. So once again, translation gets us in trouble. Um, so properly translated, the word, this would be turn, this would be turn and be immersed, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, in order to the forgiveness of your sins. That's how 238 should actually read. Uh, in Acts 319, repent and turn to God, and that is a turning. 
so that your sins may be wiped out. Times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Um, so once again, we, we, uh, we kind of get this going. Are there any comments here? Okay. Flip me, Shan. But we can also fall away, which is also something that I was never raised with. I was raised with the saying, once saved, always saved. That's what I heard growing up when I was growing up. Once saved, always saved. You can't fall away from God. And we would always say, well, what about those people that fell away from God? And they'd say, well, those people were never really saved to start with. That was always the answer. Um, that comes from Calvin, from predestinationalists. The idea that, um, uh, you know, if you're called to be saved, you can't not be saved. Uh, predestinational. Um, so we don't believe in that, obviously. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that you and I can absolutely fall away. 1 Corinthians 10, 12, he says, if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. So we definitely can fall. In 2 in Peter 3, 17, it says, Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard, so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position. And that's just a couple of verses um, that the Bible speaks about falling. But there's a lot of verses that allude to that, and maybe um, in a more harsh sense, maybe uh, Hebrews 10, uh, 24 and following, but but there's a lot of verses in the Bible that talk about our being able to fall away. We call that to apostatize. We call that apostasy, to fall out of the grace of God. And, of course, when we do that, we know we have to repent, to turn, and to come back to God. We know we don't have to be baptized again because John tells us if we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So every time we sin, we don't have to get rebaptized. I hope we understand that. We're in a continual state of cleansing as long as we're a Christian, as long as we're walking with God. We're in a continual uh, state of, of cleansing. So if we put all this together, flip me, Shannon. I can't believe my clicker don't work. So that's the easy way, right? The uh, used to be the five-finger exercise because so they didn't put live faithfully in there. And, and uh, Walter Scott used to ride into town on his horse during Reformation, and he would hold his fist up and he would say I'm going to give you the five fingers to be saved and the kids would all tell their parents and they would fill the meeting house and Walter Scott would teach a blazing sermon on hear and confess and repent and be baptized and he would and he would preach that sermon and use all those little pat verses that we've used all our lives but I hope you understand that salvation is really more complex than this uh, we like things simple we like us we like a formula but there's not really a, so much a formula for salvation. A lot of these things, it's hard to find anywhere that this is all together in the Bible. Um, you can put different things together and make it work, but you're not really going to find this all in one place. So a lot of this comes from the idea you have to hear the word, right? We know that. You have to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Uh, you have to repent. Confession's tougher. I mean, we see that, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart, you will be saved, uh, Romans 10. But, but um, we don't see a lot of confession in salvation in Acts. But if you believe and you come to be baptized, I kind of think you're confessing that you know what you're doing and you know Jesus Christ is God. But we always have people confess, say, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and then to be immersed and then to live a faithful life. Flip me, Shan. So baptize is a transliterated word. Not translated, because if it was translated, it would be immerse, and that's what it means. It means to immerse. Translated, transliterated word means to immerse. Do we have any biblical examples of sprinkling or pouring? Can you all think of any? I'm open. No, we don't have any examples. Do we have any biblical examples of a baby being baptized? Just throwing that out there. Household of the debtor. That's the only argument. That's the only one they use. And if you ever re look at debates with petty old Baptists, that's their argument is, is the Philippian jailer, his whole household was baptized. But that's pretty weak. <laughs> pretty weak. <laughs> so, uh, 
or we don't know. <laughs> so what three things are accomplished at baptism? Acts 2.38, it says, uh, be baptized for the what? Forgiveness of your sins. So your sins are forgiven. Acts 22, Paul says, rise. Uh, you know, why tarry thou? Rise, you baptize, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Acts 2.41, being baptized also does what? Add you to the Lord's body, right? Add you to the church, the assembly, the Lord's body, okay? And, and I think the word church, like I said, tough word. Um, and the other thing it does in Galatians 3, it says that when you're baptized into Christ, you what? Clothe yourself with Christ. So you're clothed with Christ. So on the day of judgment, the way I always look at that is on the day of judgment, God doesn't see you standing there. He sees Jesus standing there. You're clothed with Christ, which is a, which is a really big... Flip me, Shan. Yeah, that's right. You, if you wasn't clothed with you got to go. So baptism has to be according to knowledge, right? To repent means to turn away from sin and toward God. And apostasy means to fall away. Is that the last one, Shani? We made it all the way through. Congratulations. I hope you've enjoyed this. Apostasy. <laughs> To apostatize. I've enjoyed teaching it. We're probably doing Acts next Wednesday night. <laughs>